This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hello, you're listening to Animal Party on Pet Life Radio with me, Deb Wolf. And I have Dusty Rainbow, my favorite cat expert, back on the show today. Welcome, Dusty. Well, thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Okay, well, I want to start with a little bit of a warning to everybody in my neighborhood because we've had we've had a really bad problem lately with cougars and coyotes. So the cougars are being spotted all through an area called Poco, Port Coquitlam and Coquitlam. And they're on city streets. They're in townhouse developments. They're scaling fences. They're traveling in groups. Don't leave your cats and dogs outside even for a minute. Go out with them. Well, keep your cats in, period. Have your dogs on leash. Go out with them. Do not think that your big dog is safe. Do not think that your little dog is safe because it's in a little yard. They can scale anything. And they've been taking pets. Over in Stanley Park, which is the best place to jog, beautiful, beautiful downtown forest, ocean, beautiful 10K runs. Nobody should be running there right now because coyotes have been attacking runners. And the guy who got attacked is a huge, big, young guy. He just happened to be the last jogger in a group of joggers. So don't be the last jogger. Don't even go right now. Yeah, he got bit and he stood up against the coyote and uh, you're supposed to stand up. You're not supposed to run. You're supposed to be loud, wave your arms, yell, scream. He did all that and it attacked him again. So this is very unusual behavior. They think that perhaps because of Corona, there's been increased park use, which means increased feeding of all these animals with garbage or intended feeding. And now this is what's happening. So never, ever feed wildlife and just be careful in, if you're in those areas. And I guess, Dusty, I'd like to open it up to you. Do you have problems like this where you live? Oh, absolutely. Uh, coyotes are everywhere. There was a woman who wrote a book about coyotes and uh, it was science-based and every large city has coyotes. And of course, if you're in the country, you have them. But uh, her book, oh gosh, I wish I could remember her name. Carol Cataino, I think was her name. And according to her research, cats are actually the preferred food, preferred prey for coyotes. And they don't know if it's because they actually like the flavor of cats better or if cats are just easy pickings. But they can also easily jump an eight foot fence. So just because you have a, a big high fence doesn't mean that your pets are protected. Well, they also climb. I mean, I've seen seen incredible things by koi dogs, which are people's pets that happen to have been the accidental offspring of coyote dog. And they're not as agile. They're not as nimble. They're not as smart as the actual coyote. And yet they can do things no dog can do. So uh, the real coyotes, they walk in such a way as to leave their tracks don't look like regular dog tracks. When my dog runs, you see four paws. And you can see two and two. You can just see the the way the body is built. Four paws, four paws, four paws as he runs along. When a coyote runs, he will step into his own footfalls. So he leaves a track like a hopping dog. It's a quarter less scent because he's standing in his own tread the whole time. I mean, these guys are, they're the geniuses of the dog world. They can trick dogs by pretending to be lame or friendly, or social, or by sending one of their females in heat out. They can do all kinds of things to get your dog to follow them and then kill him or mate with him, her, and get her pregnant. That's how those koi dogs started. <laughs> you know. So you really, really don't want to mess with them. And you don't want your dogs to have anything to do with them because they do have heartworm and all kinds of other things. Everything a dog can die from, a coyote can give it. So their species are the same. They're all canines. So you don't want any mixing or smelling of poops or any kind of contact with your dogs if you can avoid it. So if you see the markings of coyotes, which are these kind of furry bits left on wire fencing, if you could, if you see them or you see signs that they're in an area and then put your dog on leash, just don't let it wander. A coyote can be eight or 10 feet from you and you won't know it. And there can be 20 or 30 of them and you might only see two. They're incredible predators. So I just want everyone to be extra, extra careful. Well, you know, there, uh, it's been a few years, but I live in a suburb of Dallas and I walked outside at 
oh, about 10 in the morning and was shocked to see a coyote casually loping on the opposite side of the street. And I, I watched him from one end of the street until he disappeared. And it was, you know, I yelled at him. He looked over at me and and just kept moving. I mean, he, he was running, but he was not running from me. He was just continuing to move in uh, the pattern that he was. So it doesn't matter where you live. There are coyotes. If you have a green belt, you got coyotes. Well, yeah, you know, people think <laughs> it's interesting. But when, when I look at a landscape, I see things differently. Like when I see a river, that's a highway. When I yes. see a golf course, that's no man's land. Golf course at night, that's covered in coyotes. That's where they go. I mean, these are areas where there's no traffic and almost no human activity so much of the time. Beaches are the same. You know, water, they, you know, they have water. And when you have water, you have prey species. So there you go. I mean, it's it's the perfect place. Well, and if we can keep our cats and dogs safe, then they will kill the rats. And 98 percent, 90 to 90 percent of the canine diet of a wild canine diet can be rats and rodents. We just have to be smart about this and not mm -hmm. make our cats the easiest prey out there, because I bet they are, you know, overfed and docile and hanging around. No wonder compared to a squirrel that is like quite edgy, <laughs> you know. And if a cat's been raised around dogs, then they they mm -hmm. just assume that all dogs are OK. So it might not be a bad idea to let, I mean, in the training here, when I have my, my cats and they're growing up, they do experience good dogs and they they have a lot of interaction with dogs, but there's a next door neighbor dog, Hank, who's terrible and he's a coon hound. And it's good that they see that he comes running at the fence rah, 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 and they run away. And, you know, I want them to keep, keep that fresh. Not every dog is your friend. So mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't be a bad idea to make sure your cats aren't thinking all dogs are like your mush bucket retriever that loves them. You know, uh, yeah, stranger danger. <laughs> we do it with our kids. We ought to do it with our cats. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go to break and we'll be back on Animal Party Pet Life Radio with our guest, Dusty Rainbow. Stay tuned. For those fortunate to have experienced the deep bond and unconditional love of a companion animal, the death that follows can be one of the most difficult and misunderstood losses to go through. Many times, this devastating loss goes unrecognized and trivialized by family and friends, leaving grieving pet parents struggling to find healthy ways to cope with the loss. In And I Love You Still, a thoughtful guide and remembrance journal for healing the loss of a pet, Dr. Julianne Corbin calls attention to the difficulties unique to the loss of a beloved pet and provides an interactive and compassionate guide to help you process your loss and work towards coming to a place of peace and healing. For those interested in journal therapy and looking for a professionally written and compassionate resource to help understand and reconcile the grief associated with the loss of your pet, this book is for you. And I Love You Still, a thoughtful guide and remembrance journal by Julianne Corbin is now available for purchase on Amazon and other major book retailers. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Hello! You're listening to Animal Party on Pet Life Radio, and I'm here with Dusty Raymolt. You know, sometimes people in the dog world, it's, it's not 100% accurate, but there is this idea that there's a rule of thumb that a large, medium to large breed puppy at the age of three months is about half what it's going to be. Now, again, it's not accurate. There's dogs that outgrow that, and there's dogs that are smaller. But in general, it is fairly true most of the time that if you've got a large breed dog at around three to four months, double that, and that's what you're going to get in the end. So is there something like that for cats and kittens? Absolutely. The rule of thumb with kittens is a kitten will put on one pound of weight per month up until about six or eight months. So yeah, if you have a kitten that weighs one pound, then you're guessing about four weeks. Okay, so what I'm trying to guess, okay, say that again, because I'm trying to guess how big the cat will become. 
Oh, it's kind of hard to tell. <laughs> yeah. Generally, a kitten is going to gain about a pound a month. Till when do they stop? Uh, six to eight months. Really? They start slowing down. Now, some it depends on the breed. Uh, I have Turkish bands, and there are some breeds that don't completely mature until they're five years old. Uh, Maine Coons are another one. Right, uh, okay. Whereas a typical cat will be fully mature and grown at two years. But, I mean, you know, they usually they stop growing around a lot, around 10, 12 months. Does neutering affect their growth the same way it does dogs and not so much? Yes and no. Uh, you know, since you have the big difference in size with the dogs, yes. Uh, uh, generally, uh, if you neuter a male, he's going to be a little bit bigger. But for the most part, not. I don't think it affects them as much as it does a dog. It'll be a little smaller, you mean, than a tom, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think you got that. And backwards. also, you're not going to have the big fat face and uh, yeah, so there, the big there are head. a lot of physical differences. Yes. Okay. And so what you were saying with the other math was that it's one pound per week. So if you have a four no, month, pound month, one pound, if I said month. week, I'm totally wrong. No, I probably okay. got it wrong. So one pound okay. per month. Okay. Yeah. I had the experience this summer where someone called me and said, you know, we, we know these people and they're in dire straits and they're searching for a nursing mother cat. And I didn't have a nursing mother cat. And I said, you know, you're going to have to get formula. You're going to have to bottle feed these kittens. Yeah, we're trying, but the kittens won't latch. They won't do anything. Is there anything you can suggest? So I sent them a standard poodle nursing mother, even <laughs> though I knew, I knew the milk wasn't going to be good enough. But I sent her there for a week, hoping that it would sort of keep them alive, keep them warm, keep them clean, keep them wanting to live, keep them somewhat nourished while they transferred to bottle. And it worked. So three days or so is all it took. And then the people were able to get these kittens to actually feed off the bottle and the poodle didn't have to be there anymore. The poodle, oh my gosh, when she first got there, I mean, she's kind of a cat chaser and everything was okay until they would meow. And then she just stared down like, what? Those are puppies. What? You know, but she got over her cat chasing ways and uh, it's quite good. The, one of these kittens, as a thank you, they gave him to me. And so he's one of my cats now. And he's the one I'm worried about. I'm going to have to teach him that not all dogs are our friends. Because, oh boy, he thinks, he thinks his mother was a dog. He is, <laughs> yeah. he is like so dog friendly, it's ridiculous. You know, he chases their tails and he cleans their ears and he hangs out with all my doodles and poodles. So I'm definitely going to have to give him a that uh, that lesson you're talking about. So what I'll do is I'll I'll have someone holding him and comforting him, but I'll have a dog that is quite a chaser come in on leash, not get to chase him fully, but make sure he understands this is not this is not your friend. You should run from this, and hopefully he will. I don't think it's a good idea to have somebody hold him because if you're trying to get him to be fearful, yeah, you got to let go. I just meant to have him there. Yes. So they're holding him. So when I come in the room, he's there. Yes. And then you let go because you want him to run. You yes. want him to you, escape. For other people that may be thinking about this, do not put the cat in a carrier and do that. You don't <gasps> no. want the cat to be caged. No. Because he has no place to run. He, I mean, that would just be, that would have the opposite effect. You're trying to teach him what to do when a coyote or a wolf or a dog next door chases him and he needs to get out of there. What's yeah. he supposed to do? So you want, you want him to run away. Yes. And, and if you're holding him, you might get hurt really bad. So you don't want to. Well, do that's that. true too. Yeah. He'll dig his claws in because he's, he's going to be surprised. This cat that loves dogs is going to be shocked and panicky. And that's okay because better that than be shocked and then dead. Right. So when the real thing happens. Yeah, I do think that cats can learn a lot of things. So how can you teach a cat to come when called, Dusty? Let's do that. Well, first of all, something pleasant needs to happen every time your cat sees you. You know, pet them, you talk to them, you give them a treat, put a little catnip out there, you get the cat toy out. Something pleasant needs to happen every time. And I have really good luck with turkey baby food. And I, can I use a, Sure. Name brand. Okay. Yeah. I use Gerber because it does not contain onion or, or garlic, but always check because uh, you don't want to feed them anything with garlic. But every time I call them, they get baby food. And, um, you know, uh, you can start out by calling their name. And if they turn their head toward you, you click them 
I use my I use my tongue because I always have you it have with a me. clicker. Yes, exactly. We're all built with a clicker. Yes. Uh, yeah. And, and besides, I you know, if I'm trying to manipulate the uh, the baby food and this, I can't hold a clicker and do stuff at the same time. So I use my tongue. It works. So uh, he looks at me and I click. And then as he responds more and more the way I want him to, I click the more advanced actions. And it, you know, eventually he's going to go, Oh, there she is. You call, he comes, click, there you go. But the timing is really important. You need to click as he is doing the action, not afterwards, because he's learning that whenever, whenever he hears that click, what is happening at that moment is what you're clicking. But if he's doing something else by the time you click, then he's going to associate the reward with whatever it is, That's the later action. Because with dogs, it's the last thing he did. He, he right. you get the reward. But with the cat, it's the thing they're doing right then. Mm -hmm. So it's a little trickier. And most people, the timing mistake most people make when training dogs is they reward the behavior they don't want. They let's say that the dog is shy. They reward it when it's being nervous rather than bold. Mm -hmm. Or if it's rude, they reward it when it's being rude instead of polite. You know, they they touch it and they talk to it and they they react to it when it's jumping up and they ignore it when it's on the ground. Well, right. if you just flip that, you'll have a good dog. Right? <laughs> and the same with the cat. I mean, if you have a cat, I notice this with Netflix. Whenever I'm watching Netflix, my cats are always between me and the screen. Very annoying, you know. They can't go on the other side. No, they can't go on the other side because I won't notice them there. I right. only notice them if they're in my way. And it used to be when I had more of an old fashioned office, they used to always be in the inbox, never in the outbox, always in the inbox, because that's where all my stuff was. So you kind of <laughs> you kind of have to figure out if you're unconsciously rewarding them for being bad, like so many of us do. If my cat jumps on the counter, boy, do I notice. But if he doesn't jump on the counter, I don't really tell them how great he is for not doing that, you know? Well, how many people, they jump on the counter and they give them a treat and then put them down. It's like, oh, oh well, you just, you just trained your cat how to jump on the counter. <laughs> yes, yes. That's actually how to train a, a cat to jump on the counter. Oh my goodness. Okay, so we're going to go to break and we're going to come back with how to train a cat not to jump on the counter, everybody. With Dusty Rainbow, my guest, stay tuned. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, Stitcher, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Hello, we're back on Animal Party Pet Life Radio, and Dusty Rainbow is our guest, and we just told you how to train your cat to jump on the counter, and now we're going to train your cat to stay off the counter. Okay, Dusty, how do they do that? Well, if we have somebody that just absolutely has to be on the counter because you're fixing food or, or I mean, you know, or it's a good place to get away from the dog. Or, you know, and, and cats naturally prefer high places. So let's give him an alternative. First of all, we don't reward him. We don't give him any treats. He doesn't get anything when he's up there. Uh, you know, put him down on the ground. Get a stool. Get a stool that's elevated and reward him when he gets on the stool. And that way he can still watch you. He can still see what's going on. He's getting treats but he doesn't get anything when he goes on the counter. And if he's a real counter surfer and he does it when you're not there, then you can set up some little landmines. I like the little aluminum trays that are like um, an inch, an inch deep. 
they're noisy. Well, yeah. Right? But it, if they step on them, does it make it's kind of like unpleasant and noisy? Well, it's not noisy, but they get wet. So you put it, oh. you put like a little bit of a little trace <laughs> of water mean. in there and they jump up and that takes care of it pretty fast. Or you could put sticky paws up there and they don't like that. Put it on a piece of cardboard. Don't put it on the counter because that's going to be a huge mess. But, uh, you know, if if they're not getting the message, then you can try different non deterrence, yeah. violent deterrence. Yes. And some things are inadvertent rewards. Like if your butter dish <laughs> this is <laughs> gross. For those people who don't own cats, I apologize. It's going to make you a little queasy. But for those of you who have a butter <laughs> dish that does, <laughs> that does not have a tight fitting lid, then you know as well as I do that it is regularly visited by your cats. They lick all around the outsides. That's a constant reward for jumping up there. Absolutely. <laughs> so if you are using water as a deterrent, does that even work with Turkish vans? Your cats are swimmers, right? Well, okay, so think of Turkish vans like little five-year-old boys. You know, little five-year-old boys, how do you get them out of the swimming pool? They love to swim. But when it's bath time, it's a whole different thing, okay. even though it's basically <laughs> the same concept. But uh, so if if you have those little, uh, what, eight, eight by 10 trays uh, with just a trace of water in them, and it is going to make a mess because they're going to jump and they're, they're going to go all over the place. But if it's just water, it's not that big a deal. But no cat wants to get wet if it's not their idea. So right, yes, okay. they're not, they are not going to appreciate it. And after that's happened a couple of times, they'll figure out something else, especially if they have an acceptable alternative to both of you and they get rewarded for that alternative. Okay. So I just want to put this out there. If anyone listening decides to do this, please, please send me the video. Please. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see this. I really want to see this. I'm going to try it. I may film this. I'm going to see what I can do. Maybe I'll put it up on my Deb Wolf Pet Expert YouTube channel. But I really want to see other people's cats discovering that the counter has water. Oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, the, the reaction is, is hilarious. Uh, but it's also effective and it's not going to hurt them. It's just going to it's just going to upset them for a few minutes. Do you think that or in your experience, do some cats appear to be what we would call in human terms, old souls, wise beyond their years, like they were reincarnated? Uh, this is a question from a listener, actually. She says she's had dogs before that seem clueless and then other dogs that just seem like from the moment you meet them as puppies, they've they've already lived a full life. And now she has this cat that is what she says, an old soul. Is it possible? Do other people think this way? She wants to know, or is she just putting human attributes to animals? Well, I've had some old souls myself. Uh, and yes, I mean, I have to admit, I didn't believe in reincarnation in any way, shape or form, human, animal or, or otherwise. And then after my husband put his 19 and a half year old cat to sleep, about three years later, I was at PetSmart at the uh, adoption center. And this cat actually reached out and touched me on the shoulder. It was, it was kind of like the old joke where, you know, you touch the person on the shoulder and then you move your hand. And I looked and it was basically the same cat. And he was reaching, I mean, his little armpit was as far out of the cage. I mean, he was reaching so hard and he was trying to get my attention. And it's like, oh my gosh, that looks just like the cat. I mean, everything. And I don't think they necessarily have to look like the, the original cat. I wound up signing the adoption papers and taking him home that day and uh, brought him in and just released him, which I shouldn't have done, but I did. And we were in a different house than we were when he was alive. Well, anyway, so the cats that knew him just kind of went, Hey, <laughs> where you been? <laughs> and really? The other cats, the wow. Other, and the other cats hissed at him. Wow. And he acted like he didn't know where he was, which of course he wouldn't have because it was a new house. And my husband came home and he said, where'd the cat come from? And I lied. And I said, I found him near PetSmart. <laughs> I found him near PetSmart. And Another then gift. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Then, but I can't lie to him. So I told him, he said, he has to go back. And I said, eh, you watch him for a couple hours. You know, they said they'd take him back. 
you watch them for a couple hours, see what you think. So I didn't get the cat litter that I had gone to PetSmart to get. So I had to go to Petco to pick up cat litter. And uh, I called him and said, uh, well, you know, what's the deal? Do I need to get kitten food or not? He said, well, we have a kitten. And so he also agreed that this was that cat. And wow. And everything he did, every way he reacted was like this cat. It was just crazy. You know, it's a similar topic, not exactly, but recently I adopted out, fostered out a two-year-old Great Pyrenee, big dog. And the people who owned him before, they can't keep him. They had to find a new home for him. He was here for a little while. I interviewed and vetted a bunch of people, found a nice family. Okay. The people who had him before said, never liked to swim, not a swimmer. The new people used to have a Newfoundlander dog, loved to swim, swam every day. So when they get this Pyrenee dog, they decide, well, let's go to the lake. We're going to take him to the lake. And what does he do? He swims just like their old dog. Now, I think sometimes it's just, you know, those people wanted it so much. This is what they do. This is the way they are. The dog picked up on it, gave it a whirl. You know, I think sometimes they just fit, you know, like I used to have this cat that was always on the back of my chair whenever I was doing radio and I've, and he's not with me anymore. He passed, but I know there's going to be another one take his place. Like mm -hmm. they just find that niche, don't they? They do. They absolutely do. It's uh, and sometimes when you have a a cat that passes and uh, other cats take on those characteristics, it could be that this was a a more dominant cat or whatever. In some of these cases, uh, it's like, oh well, this this territory, this toy is now free, so I can I can use it. It's not being monopolized by this other cat. So, you know, I think there's some of that too. And, and like I said, I did not believe in reincarnation until we had this situation with this cat. And what I perceive is one thing, but when the cats that knew him had no adjustment period whatsoever, and the cats who didn't know him were hissing at him, it was just really strange. And by the way, if you have reincarnation stories, I'd love to hear those. <laughs> Your listeners. We're about to wrap up the show, so you may as well tell them. Where should they send their cat ghost stories, dog ghost stories, horse ghost stories, and I guess reincarnation stories? Yes, please. Uh, please send them to dustycatwriter at verizon.net. I'm going to spell it one more time. D-U-S-T-Y-C-A-T-W-R-I-T-E-R, -E all one word, at verizon.net. And so any paranormal story, I'd love to hear it. But if you have a couple of minutes of video of your <laughs> cats <laughs> doing the Dusty Rainbow Counter Challenge, I want to see it. So send it to <laughs> me, devwolfpetexpert at gmail.com, and I will happily post, oh, I can't wait to see these flying cats discovering there's <laughs> water on the counter. Naughty, naughty kitties, all of you butter raiders. You should know better. Okay. Well, I do give my cats a little bit of butter, like when they're good, a little bit off my finger, let them lick it, helps break down the hairballs. And that way they're not so incessant about trying to get out my butter dish. Guard your butter dish, everybody. Now that you know, <laughs> if there seems to be a hair in it, yeah, that's a sign. That's not your hair. That's your cat. Yuck. Okay. Clean out the butter dish. Start over. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dusty. Thank you for having me. I had a great time. I can't wait to come back again. Oh, we'll do something in the summer. Thank you so much. Okay, everyone. From me, Deb Wolf, and Animal Party Pet Life Radio and Dusty Rainbow, be good, dear animals. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.